Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom. This is the first video in a three-part series all about permaculture, which I've been practicing here on my small holding in the west of Ireland for six years. In video two, I'm going to demonstrate each of the 12 permaculture principles, which many of you may have read about, by showing you practical examples here on my homestead. And in video three, I'm gonna take on the weeds, which we get a lot of here in Ireland, believe me. And I'm gonna examine whether permaculture offers the secret to managing them. First though, in this video, I want to ask the question, what does permaculture really mean? Because if you can grasp the concept and its importance, then implementing it, whether that's on a farm or an apartment balcony, becomes a lot more intuitive than you might think. But to explain that concept, I've decided that one definition just doesn't cut it. So in this video, I'm going to give you three. Let's get started. The first definition is permanent culture, which comes from Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, who were the originators of permaculture as a modern concept back in the 1970s. What does permanent culture mean? Well, to understand that, you first have to consider the way contemporary agriculture works. The food that supplies supermarkets and grocery stores, no matter what country you live in, is almost entirely grown on monoculture farms. That's farms which grow a single crop on each piece of land. And that crop could be wheat, it could be potatoes, broccoli or other brassicas, apples, avocado, rice, soy, palm oil, grass even. Or it could be livestock, producing beef, lamb, chicken, etc. There are thousands of different types of crop, but one thing is true right around the world. When it comes to feeding the masses, those crops are grown individually, monoculture. And not only that, but they're grown in a way which views nature as antagonistic to that process, something to be overcome, to be suppressed and controlled, be it with pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, or of course the might of modern agricultural machinery, powered, as we all know, by oil. Something like 10 calories of the black stuff for every one calorie of food produced through that system. Monoculture farming, or contemporary agriculture, as it exists everywhere today, is largely about replacing natural ecosystems, made up of thousands of intricate relationships between plants, animals, uh, invertebrates, like that bee, and of course people. We're a part of nature too, with single crops. Why? Well, because it's simple, and nature certainly isn't simple. But the really interesting thing is that nature with its intricate relationships and multi-layered ecosystems of trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, ephemerals, birds, invertebrates, mammals, all existing together, produces a much higher yield than monoculture farming ever could. The calorific yield per acre of wilderness here in Ireland is many times higher than the calorific yield per acre of monoculture farmland. This is what Ireland should look like. It's what it used to look like. And isn't it magical? Just look at that folks, the very first ripe cherry tomato of the season. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online community for learning skills through educational video classes. And I hope in the not too distant future to publish a class myself on Skillshare on the subject of permaculture design, the next step to follow this introductory series here on YouTube. If you want to learn more about permaculture right now, uh, at least after watching this video, then Skillshare already features a three hour long introduction to permaculture which goes into much more detail than I can. As well as this class, Gardening 101, a guide to growing and caring for plants by Geraldine Levin. And if you find the idea of permaculture a bit intimidating, or you just don't know where to start in your own garden, then this is definitely the video series for you because it breaks down all the basic gardening concepts from planning to propagation to harvesting and storage. Skillshare as a platform continues to grow all the time. I've been using it now for several years and every time I log in there are new classes taught by industry professionals and this is the important part in a way that makes learning fun. 
it's free to browse their content, so if you're not sure, go take a look for yourself. You never know what you'll find. Finally, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link at the top of the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. And a big thank you to the Skillshare team for being a long term sponsor of Mossy Bottom. Mmm. Worth all that work. What is wilderness? Well, take a field and leave it alone for a few hundred years. Watch the brambles creep in, then the pioneer trees like birch, hazel and willow. Watch the invasion of birds, invertebrates and small mammals as the availability of seeds, fruits and nesting sites, of course, increases. Then eventually the beech, oak and other climax species of tree arrive, uh, along with the predatory mammals and birds that they support as well as all the insects, the fungi, including a vast network of mycelium under the ground. Nature, when left alone, creates a giant tapestry of niches, each being exploited by a particular species and existing in relative balance because nature doesn't like imbalance. When one species becomes too dominant, it creates a huge opportunity for other species to take advantage of. A plague of locusts might destroy a crop but they also present an incredible bounty of food for any creatures that can catch and digest them. Could be crows, lizards, snakes, even people eat locusts. And that bounty means more young raised and the following year, more crows, more lizards, more snakes, more people. A lot more mouths to feed from that same plague of locusts until eventually the plague isn't a plague anymore. It's just another species fighting to exist. Back to that first definition, permanent culture, as conceived by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, who were themselves a biologist and an ecologist, scientists who studied and revered natural systems. Permanent culture or permaculture describes just that, a system, but one which employs polyculture, multiple species, not monoculture. A system which uses perennials, not just annuals and incorporates trees, shrubs, even livestock, as well as, of course, the biodiversity of nature itself to support, and this is the really cool part, human existence. It's not about leaving nature alone to get on with it, nor is it about embracing chaos. There's nothing chaotic about permaculture. It's about creating complex, intricately designed systems which are managed by people for the purpose of supporting people. That yield is what it's all about. So if you thought permaculture was a bit hokey or hippy dippy, then think again because it couldn't be more scientific and rational. If permanent culture is the grand concept, then my second definition of permaculture is the way to achieve it. And that is by copying nature. Take a natural ecosystem, closely observe how it functions, what are the trees, the shrubs, the perennials, the annuals and ephemerals that fill those niches within that ecosystem, and why do they thrive? What's the soil type, the climate? Are the summers hot and dry or cool and wet like here in Ireland? What invertebrates, mammals, birds and other species exist there? What are the sources of water and fuel and how do humans fit into that system? And then having observed nature, take that formula, that recipe that it provides, which will always represent the most efficient, high yielding way to turn that land into calories and substitute plants and animals which are non-beneficial to humans for plants and animals which are beneficial to humans. Copy and substitute. For instance, Instead of birch and alder trees, you might grow hazel and apple trees. In place of impenetrable brambles, uh, you might grow blackcurrant and rhubarb. Instead of thistle, you might plant perennial kale. Alongside bluebells, you might introduce wild garlic, which thrives in the same habitat under trees. Instead of a lawn, you might dig a pond and introduce frogs to control the slug population and encourage predatory insects like dragonflies good example of incorporating nature and biodiversity to the advantage of human yield. And of course, I'm just scratching the surface here with these examples 
um, and in regard to the variables at play in an ecosystem, which is why practitioners of permaculture are more like ecologists than farmers. And it's very hard to describe an average permaculture farm or garden, just as it's very hard uh, to describe an average piece of nature on this planet. It entirely depends on where that nature exists. And permaculture says, observe, understand and copy nature, but make it productive. So a permaculture farm in Australia, where the concept originated, is going to look vastly different to a permaculture farm here in Wet Island, where the climate, the soil type, the plant and animal species could not be more different. There is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to permaculture, and because you're dealing with the entire spectrum of nature and climate, there is a vast amount to observe, to learn and implement if you want to master it just in your local area. In Ireland, the land wants to be broadleaf forest, because forest is the most efficient use of that space and climate. Which is really interesting because these days most of Ireland is grass, one of the least efficient uses of land. But if you leave a field of grass for long enough, anywhere in the country, it will eventually become broadleaf forest again. So most farmers occupy their time trying to resist nature, when all nature really wants to do is increase their efficiency by occupying all the little niches that they ignore. By copying nature and working with it, permaculture doesn't need to resist it in the way that modern farming does. And that has to be a good thing, because resisting nature at the cost of oil is very expensive indeed. Nature in all its wonder and complexity is just a series of interconnected relationships between different species occupying different niches. And a permaculture farm or garden which aims to copy that has to do exactly the same, create beneficial relationships between all the variables within that system, the trees, perennials, annuals, livestock, native birds, insects, mammals, the soil, native plants, what you might consider weeds even, the climate, the wind, the sun, the rain, they have to be working with each other as they do in nature, in wild environments. And that's where definition number three comes in, my favourite. Permaculture is connecting the dots. If monoculture is a single dot capable of a single small yield, then permaculture is a hundred dots all connected together harmoniously, capable of painting a complete picture just as nature does. Permaculture is all about design. It is definitely not just throwing plant species together and seeing what happens. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not what permaculture is. You have to understand the relationships between different plants and the niche that each species occupies so that its needs can be met and so that the relationships with its neighbours are beneficial and not destructive. Ultimately, you have to understand those plants and animals in order to get the most out of them. Which, remember, is what permaculture is all about. Human yield. And that may sound straightforward, but there are so many factors to manage that you could really spend a lifetime perfecting a single food forest modelled on permaculture. In the next video I will provide practical examples from Mossy Bottom, my homestead, showing how I try to connect the dots, because understanding uh, how to create those beneficial relationships is really the key, I think, to successfully implementing permaculture where you live. But one of the really interesting things about permaculture is that despite its popularity and its association with sustainable agriculture, rightly so, none of the concepts or ideas that permaculture employs are in any way new. Even back in the 1970s, when they were first written down, they weren't new. Permaculture is how farming worked for millennia prior to industrialization and to globalization, the ability to ship food in bulk to anywhere in the world. And these practices, as we now know, are simply not sustainable. A thousand acre farm today might be run by just a few men in their 50s or 60s who spend most of their days sat on giant tractors farming just a few crops. And that's true the world over. But go back just a hundred years and thousand acre farms didn't exist. 
agriculture was much smarter. Farms would have been smaller, employing more people, using intelligence and knowledge to work alongside nature, rather than using oil to dominate it. Go back a thousand years, and people would have had no choice but to exist as part of nature, so their understanding of it would have made you and me appear to them like visitors from another planet. And that makes me quite sad, because given the choice, I'd rather understand the natural world which created me than exist apart from it. And yet I don't remember being taught how to create compost or support biodiversity or even grow my own food when I was at school. Perhaps that's changing, I hope so, for the sake of future generations and of course our planet. If you're an avid gardener, particularly one interested in fruit and vegetable production, then you'll also notice a lot of the concepts within permaculture are things you've probably been doing for years in some form. Collecting and using rainwater, making your own compost, mulching, companion planting, these aren't new ideas. And indeed, much of what John Seymour wrote about in his seminal guide to self-sufficiency, a book I've recommended previously, could also be labelled as permaculture. Not all of it, but a lot. Incidentally, the book I would most recommend if you live in a temperate climate and want to learn just about everything that's been written down about permaculture in temperate climates, like here in Ireland, is this. The Earth Care Manual by Patrick Whitefield. There are no affiliate links down in the description. I just think it's a bloody good book and one of several that I can honestly say has changed my life. And here are two more slightly less weighty tomes, again written by Patrick Whitefield. How to read the landscape is absolutely invaluable if you want to learn how to read nature, how to look at natural environments and understand those relationships between different species and climate, and how to make a forest garden, which is a much more practical design book about how to implement uh, permaculture design. Brilliant, brilliant books. No affiliate links, just honest recommendations if you want to learn more. So, what are the advantages of permanent culture? Of copying nature, of connecting the dots of permaculture? Well, if you get it right, you get a much higher yield. There's plenty of evidence now for that with established permaculture food forests around the world. The key is understanding all the variables local to you, so you can choose the right species and methodologies that will work where you live. Remember, there is no one-size-fits-all solution because nature doesn't work that way, so permaculture doesn't either. Permaculture is sustainable because nature, which it's modelled on, has to be sustainable. It uses only what energy, sunlight and organic matter provides, because that's all it has. There are no external inputs, like diesel to power machinery, or oil-based fertilisers and pesticides, or even organic inputs, like mountains of animal manure driven in. Nature has no way of importing such things, so instead it makes what it's got really count. By creating a system of beneficial interdependencies between plants, livestock, weeds and wild areas, trees, animals, and of course people, you will significantly reduce your footprint on the earth. In fact, thinking about it, a potential fourth definition of permaculture is simply sustainable agriculture. Permaculture promotes diversity because diversity is inherent in natural ecosystems. Why is diversity important? Well, other than the fact that diversity is what makes nature so beautiful, I think, it also creates resilience. Monoculture systems are far more vulnerable to environmental factors like flooding or drought, and we all see that in the news every year, as well as to disease and predation, just like that plague of locusts. Create a bounty, and nature will do everything it can to exploit that bounty. Create diversity, and if one crop fails, it's only a single dot in a much bigger picture. Permaculture farms are much more resilient, just like nature. Permaculture goes hand in hand with self-sufficiency. On a small holding like mine, it is the most efficient and intelligent way to practice self-sufficiency. And if you already live that way, as I try to, then just by applying common sense, you're almost certainly practicing permaculture already, whether you're aware of it or not. There are many other environmental advantages which fit within the umbrella of these that I've mentioned. 
like for instance um, conserving endangered species such as bees, reducing groundwater pollution, making use of renewable energy sources and of course reducing waste. But what it comes down to really is legacy. Creating a permaculture garden or farm which just like nature exists through time for future generations is one heck of a legacy to leave behind and when you're gone it'll still be there giving back. What a thought that is. And now for a question which over the years I've pondered many times and still do. Can permaculture replace modern agriculture and feed the world? And of course modern agriculture as we know has a finite lifespan because of its absolute dependency on oil. At the very least it's going to have to be drastically reimagined. In a century oil won't exist on the scale that it's currently needed to support agriculture. I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> One of the problems with permaculture is that while it works phenomenally well in domestic gardens, on homesteads uh, and small well-managed farms, it doesn't really scale well to the oil dependent mega farms which feed the world. And that's because monoculture farms are so simplistic that um, agronomists and farmers have been able to create incredibly efficient ways to operate them. If you only have one crop to manage on a thousand acre field then everything from ploughing to planting to harvesting to fertilising can be done by one or two men sat on one or two machines designed to do very specific jobs. And that level of automation is very efficient. The problem of course is that it's not really the farmers doing the work it's that ever-decreasing supply of oil. Although there are permaculture methods which can be applied to those mega farms, like conservation of hedgerows for biodiversity, like use of swales to retain water, um, like the introduction of organic matter to improve soil structure and hold nitrogen better, ultimately permaculture, because it's such a sophisticated system like nature, with uh, hundreds of species and interdependencies, will always work best on a smaller scale when closely managed and that's the key point. It needs more people power and right now global agriculture is very people averse. Why pay people to do something which oil can do for less money? I guess the question is for how long will that oil be cheaper? Certainly not forever. So what about organic farms I hear you cry? Are they a good solution? Well, organic farms are better for the environment and for biodiversity, certainly. They probably have a smaller carbon footprint and they probably use less fossil fuels, particularly as there's no chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Although potentially they may use more fossil fuels implementing organic alternatives to those chemical based uh, practices in order to manage pests, diseases and to add fertility to the soil. So it's not all good. And of course, organic farms still practice monoculture. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's not a solution in the way that permaculture could be. Finally, I want to end this video with a vision of the future, a vision of rural communities across the world covered in a patchwork of permaculture food forests, supporting not just themselves, but also their local towns and maybe even cities with organic seasonal food grown sustainably, not by farmers, but by ecologists who understand nature as well as our distant ancestors once did. Young people working the land with intelligence and education behind them, rather than brute force and oil. With nature as an ally, not an enemy. Imagine what that would look like from space. It's a very Star Trek vision I know, but heck, I am an optimist at heart and I think one day we will get there. One farm at a time, one garden at a time, one apartment balcony at a time. In the second video in this series I will take all 12 permaculture design principles and provide real life practical examples of how I try to implement them here on my homestead. For now though, Thank you as always for watching, subscribing and supporting the channel. This is a video I've wanted to make for a long time and I very much hope it might inspire some of you to learn more about permaculture. There is so much more to learn or even to implement more permaculture practices on your own land. 
for now though from me and all the many animals and of course plants in my own little ecosystem take care and bye for now Another 